All right. If I can have your attention, please. First of all, I want to welcome you here. And uh, you see all these wonderful empty seats here. That's kind of a sign that summer is drawing to a close. And uh, it's also a sign that we've got plenty of room for more people to come and worship with us and to learn more about Christ. So I want to just encourage you in that, that you flesh out and live out your life for Jesus the whole week so that others are interested. We also recognize that this time of year is also the time of year where we will be losing some young people. And uh, I'd like to have all those who are going back to college, if they would stand up where they are, please. They're going to college for the first time. Yeah, Juan wants to go to college again. That's good. Now, there are some that have already left. Uh, uh, Kenny has left, and Nick has left. Is there anybody else that's already left? Okay. So what I would like to do is have these young people just come up front here, and uh, we're going to form a circle around you, and I'm going to ask Pastor Corey if he would have a, a prayer of dedication and commitment for you folks as you go out to school. That you would live your life for the Lord and do well with your studies also. You can do both. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for this time of year where um, new beginnings start, Lord. And we thank you especially for each one of these young ladies who are here today, Lord, and for Kenny and Nick who have already gone. Um, Lord, we just thank you for the testimony that they've been to us. And Lord, we pray for them now as they go and seek what it is you would have them to do, Lord. We pray that you would um, bless them in their studies as they're going to college. Um, Lord, help them to uh, stay focused and help them to find a good church where they can plug in, Lord, and uh, be fed. Um, Lord, we pray that they would uh, that, that you would just bless their efforts, Lord, as they as they seek you now in this the different paths that they have, Lord. We just thank you for each one of them, and we dedicate them to you, and know that you will that you will take care of them at all times, Lord. Um, pray for their families and their parents back home, Lord, that they love them, and Lord, we just pray that you would help them to know that you're still right there with them wherever they are, and Lord, we pray that they would continue to seek you first, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, would everyone stand, please, and um, as I'm strumming through these first few chords here, would you just take some quiet time with the Lord and ask Him? Praise Him and thank Him for this time that we have together. This uh, wonderful place that He's given us.
Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for this place. Thank you, Father, for giving us these hearts that love you. Thank you for providing us salvation through your Son, our King, our Savior, and His name is Jesus. Father, we pray a special blessing on the offerings, the tithes and offerings that we're collecting here and the support of your house here, supporting your kingdom within these walls and outside of these walls. Father, we pray that your blessing would be upon them and multiply them and make them do amazing, wonderful things for your kingdom here on earth. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see Jesus lifted high.
can praise you forever and ever because of how much you love us. And in your perfection, you provided eternity. And in your perfection, you provided us with the Holy Spirit who lives within us, guiding us. And as we walk along with you, we will become more and more like Son. And this is your wish. Promise. Put it all on our hearts. We thank you for it. And Father, we pray that you would open up our eyes and ears to hear and see what the message is the pastor has for us. But Father, we also pray that you would continue this work. Preparing us for such. Amen. And then not too far back, they did awesome. 
They did amazing. Okay? But the interesting thing is, if you're a Cub fan or a Red Sox fan, you just are. It doesn't matter whether they're playing well or whether they're playing poorly. You're still going to root for them. They also have some of the, I think probably I consider the top two historical ballparks in all of Major League. Uh, I, I get to go to Fenway Park. I hope to go there someday. But uh, the Wrigley Field, I've been there a few times, and it's amazing. It's just kind of funny. You're sitting there, and you look off in the outfield, and you see people sitting on the roofs of their apartments watching the game. That's just part of the way the tradition is out there. So that, that I'd say those are committed people, wouldn't you? The fans of the Red Sox and the Cubs. Yeah. What about... The husband whose wife does not recognize him anymore. Maybe she has Alzheimer's, or maybe she had a stroke, or maybe something came along. And we know of a situation like this. It was on Power for Living back in the 80s this was presented. And he said, I made a commitment to her. For better, for worse, in sickness and health. And he said, I'm going to do it. I'm committed to her. That's commitment, isn't it? Because let's face it, husbands, we like for our wives to recognize us. It's kind of a handy thing. When they say, who are you? That's scary. <laughs> what, about, what about that friend that you made a promise to? And you've kind of grown apart over the years. This promise was made a while back. And now this former friend comes up and he said, remember you promised me you'd do thus and so when I need it done? I need it done. The temptation might be... I don't think so. That was way back when. But, because you're a man of God, a woman of God, your yes is your yes, you made a commitment. You're going to do it. That's committed, right? What does commitment look like? In our world, commitment is becoming less of an occurrence than ever before. In sports, we see it. Used to be, if I were to mention the St. Louis Cardinals, one of the greatest pitchers of all time, Bob Gibson. The guy who had led the major leagues for decades in stealing bases, Lou Brock. If I talk about one of the great fielders on the Red Sox, Nostrensky. If I think of one of the greatest catchers in Major League Baseball that played for the Cincinnati Reds, we would think of Johnny Mench. I'm not sure what team a Ross is playing for. Yeah, it just, I say it was playing for. He's been suspended, for those of you who don't know. You know, he goes to meet everybody today. There's no the Celtics. I know they were getting long in the tooth, but I think they got rid of a couple of their top players. I'm going, huh? Ah. Where's the commitment? Where's the commitment? We live in a society of convenience and immediate pleasure. Much of what we have is disposal, disposable. It's temporary. And sadly, we treat God that same way many times. He has become the God of convenience. Remember 911? Nobody was apologetic about seeking God's help after that, were they? God was that slot machine. When we need Him, we can pull it down the lever and He'll pop up three oranges. He's there when we need Him. He's seen as the God who rescues in the midst of disaster. He's become the God that people will turn to when there's no other option available. But for the follower of Jesus Christ, that is not the way it should be, is it? Christ's commitment to our salvation is unwavering. So, in view of all that Christ is to us, our commitment to Him should be a top priority, shouldn't it? Today we're going to take a major look at a major commitment which God's chosen people made after they had taken a long, hard look at their sordid past. So if you're not in Nehemiah chapter 10 yet, you need to get there. We're not going to read through every single verse because my twang just won't handle that. 
But we're going to look here at, first of all, the committed signers, seeing in verses 1 through the first part of verse 29. Well, there's a lot of people that are quite willing to agree with certain ideas. You know, that's a good idea. That's a, I, I, I get on board with that. I think we ought to do thus and so. However, oftentimes when push comes to shove, it's real easy for people that were at one time very vocal in their affirmation and support to back off, especially when it begins to affect them personally. There's a lot of different venues where this happens in churches all across this world. For example, most people believe that Bible study and Sunday school are great ideas. Okay? Anybody in here think that Bible study and Sunday school is not a great idea? Okay, Angel, would you just look around? How many people think Sunday school and Bible study is a bad idea? Now can I get real personal? You knew I would. Where are you at 9 a.m.? <laughs> oh, that was mean. But think about it. How are you doing in your daily quiet times? Are you taking time to read the Bible? Or just when you say, you know, things are going south. I need to be doing something different. Maybe I should start reading my life. If there's a shortage of teachers, or if the materials that are being studied become a bit too personal, it's pretty easy to criticize or to simply avoid it. <coughs> Most people would agree that ministry and supporting those people in ministry and paying the bills is important, but when things begin to get tight financially, it's much easier to back off and look to other people to give, to kick in. And please, I understand what it means to have difficulties financially on a family level. We just replaced the transmission and tires. But I can guarantee you, and I don't say this to be bragging or anything like that, but our giving to the local church will not change to be reduced. Because that's a budgetary item that will always be. We wouldn't dare think of telling our fuel oil guy or CMP or whoever it is that does the electricity that, you know, my car broke down or the groceries have gone up, so I'm going to only pay half of what I paid last time. But what do we do with our church finances? What did the Israelites do with their giving to the temple? Treasury? Same type of, you know, what we do is nothing new, is it? Solomon said that in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. We just have different labels. And wrap it differently. But here in Nehemiah 10, that's not the case. Isn't that nice? We remember that the people who were chosen by God have already spent a great deal of time recognizing who God is and who they were. They had experienced that deep conviction in their own hearts for their sin. And they were amazed and astonished by God's incredible forgiveness and His forbearance in their lives. But their conviction was not simply emotion at that moment. You know what that's like? It's like going to camp meetings or Bible uh, meetings or VBS meetings or uh, Bible camps. A lot of really big emotion at the time and then you leave and all of a sudden that's gone. That's not what they're experiencing here. Yeah, there was emotion involved with it, but they are so convicted that it's causing them to say, I want to do things differently. How do we know that? Because they're willing to sign on the line, if you will. They're willing to put their names on the paper. They were going to let the whole community know what God meant to them. They were willing to be held accountable to the fact that they were going to live in a God-honoring way from this point forward. They were going to let everyone know that they were followers of the one true God. Now we have something like that next Tuesday. Next, yeah, next Tuesday. Next Sunday. Thank you. It's going to be taking place. Just had cat had panic attacks. Like, how are we going to do that? 
We're going to have a baptism service again for two more individuals. They are publicly proclaiming, I belong to Jesus. And it's not just, I don't care who knows, it's, I want everyone to know. I belong to Jesus. And I want to live my life in a way that shows that Jesus is my Savior. Baptism. It's like signing on the line. Now, are you scared? No, she's not scared. This is where we have that proclamation. It's an invitation to everyone. I want you to hold me accountable. You see me walking in a way that is dishonoring to God. You hold my feet to the fire. He helped me to get back in line where I need to be. Now this page contains a variety of individuals, the majority of whom we would never really recognize. But let's just take a brief look here at some of the people. In the first eight verses, you have the political leaders, the spiritual leaders, the governor, the priests. They commit themselves to signing this document. Now why is that important? Folks, if the leadership is not willing to be committed, why would anyone else want to be? If the leadership steps on and says, hey, I'm sold out to this. I'm signing my name on the line. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. People will follow. Won't they? People will follow. Now, if you look at verses 19 through 27, we read all of the names of the Levites and the leaders of the people. In other words, all those who were in service to the Lord for the benefit of God's chosen people, they were also willing to show their absolute commitment to doing things differently than had been done for previous generations. Remember the priests earlier? The prophets railed against them because it says, you are leading the people wrongly. You know better, but you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Is it any wonder that the people are in sin? You yourselves are practicing sin. But how far can this go? What exactly is being signed here? Well, look at verses 28 and the first part of 29, and you get a clear understanding of this. It says, now the rest of the people, the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, catch this next part, and all those who had knowledge and understanding are joining with their kinsmen, their nobles. Wow. That's like saying everyone that can understand what's being said, that understand who God is and who we are in relation to Him, says, yeah, I want to sign up. I'm willing to commit myself. I'm fully committed to living my life for God. Now, if we can be so blunt, it's not that they understood every little nuance. I don't understand every single nuance, and I've been trained. But they understood that they were sinners, and that God was a forgiving and gracious and compassionate God. And they realized that they needed and wanted to show love and appreciation and honor to the Lord who had preserved them, who had guided them, who could have destroyed them, but in spite of the rebellion, He delivered them. And they said, yeah, I want to sign. I want to put my name there. But what are they specifically committing themselves to by their signatures? Because if you're thinking and listening with the servant, you're saying, okay, but what specifically are they signing up for? What are they committing themselves to? Well, let's go to verse 29. I'm glad you asked that question because I've got some more to share with you. Through the end of the chapter, we're looking at the commitment specifics now. Now we see in the last part of verse 29, a commitment to God in all areas. 
They were taking on themselves a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given through Moses, God's servant, and to keep and to observe all the commandments of God our Lord and His ordinances and His statutes. Now you see, a curse and an oath? Why? Well, that was the way a covenant was made. Because remember what God says? If you do this, I'm going to flush your socks off. That's a paraphrase. Okay? But if you don't do this, watch out. It's going to be dry when it should be wet. When it's supposed to be dry, it's going to get wet. Your life's going to be miserable. That's the curse. So what they're saying is, Lord, if we follow after you, we know your blessings. We're willing to do it. But Lord, if we don't follow after you, we deserve everything we're going to get. Now, what stands out to me here is this simple word, all. All. They were not going to pick and choose which things to obey. Because they had done that in the past. And how well did that work out for them? Not well at all. They tried to blend worshiping God with worshiping the false gods from other nations. They remembered how they had mixed everything together in the past and it resulted in punishment for the rebellion to God. <coughs> all of these individuals who signed and every single person who understood were stating the fact that they were committed to do what? <coughs> to walk in God's law. Folks, that's why I have no problem, and you should have no problem, going up to a brother and sister in Christ that's living in disobedience and saying, didn't you promise to live for Jesus? <coughs> why are we so polite and don't do that? We're not doing anybody a favor by ignoring an act when it's not happening. Folks, if someone is playing out in the street and there's a log truck coming, I do hope you're not going to be polite that you'll knock them across the street or jerk their arm off and get them off the street. If someone is not living their life for Jesus, we have an obligation because we are our brother's keeper. You see, Scripture says, brothers, if you see someone who's caught in spiritual sin, you who are spiritual, doesn't mean you're perfect, but you're wanting to live for Jesus, go to Him in an effort to restore Him to bring him back. But do so with the spirit of gentleness. In other words, you're not saying, I want to see you spell that out. No. You're not doing that, but you're saying, I'm concerned for your spiritual well-being. It doesn't appear like you're living for Jesus. Help me to understand what's going on here. How can I help you get back to walking with Jesus the way you ought to be? Did that hurt? <laughs> <laughs> he acted like I just smacked him. But, you know, if he's walking with Jesus, we're okay. So what does it mean? It encompasses everything which God commanded. Everything that God commanded. To say, and, and here's where I just, I'm so baffled. To say that we love Jesus, that we love God, and yet we pick and choose areas that we want to obey. John says we're liars. And the truth is not in us. What? We're putting ourselves above God if we can pick and choose what passages to obey and which not to obey. We have to submit to the authority of God's Word. And, and folks, do not, do not allow the so-called experts or our culture to tell you what is relevant and what we can follow and what we don't have to follow i.e. man, woman, marriage, for life. <coughs> Has it changed? How do I know that? Because God says, I do not change. James says, he does not change like shifting shadows. And he said, man, woman, permanent. He also says, man, man, woman, woman, abomination. He also says, Divorce, I hate it. He also says, Fathers, don't provoke your children. Oh man, I should have stopped when I was a kid. 
Fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Children, obey the parents of the Lord. Everyone obey the law of the land. We could go on and on, couldn't we? <coughs> Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Obey my words. It's not difficult. And don't fall for the line where someone says, well, Jesus didn't really say that. Because if you use that line, you're saying that Jesus is not God. What does Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, all Scripture is God breathed. Not just the parts that you're comfortable with. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it goes on and it says, He became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Verse 14. Who is that? Jesus. Jesus doesn't have to be quoted as saying it because Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit were all involved in the inspiration of God's Word. <coughs> you can't separate it out. Israel is going to deal with four specifics in this God's law thing. I have no part of this, but I... And convinced as I read through this, as I look at the entirety of the Old Testament of Israel's history, that the reason that these four areas are discussed specifically is because these four areas were major stumbling blocks to the spiritual health of Israel in the past because they defied God in each of these four areas. Let's look at them. In verse 30, we read of a renewed commitment to God's design for spouses. It says, We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. You know, if a people wants to see their civilization and their culture crumble quickly, ignore this. When the church ignores this, the culture and the civilization will collapse. When a culture ignores God's guidelines for marriage and family, it does so at its own peril. Now, don't get in your head the idea that, well, this is profiling. God's saying that the Jews are better than anybody else. That they can't marry with people from other cultures and ethnicities. That's not what he's saying. How do you know that, Pastor? It sounds like it. Well, look at the entirety of Scripture. You know of Rahab. You've heard of her. You've heard of Ruth? Not <laughs> Jewish by birth, weren't they? But they became Jews by choice. Because they said, and Ruth said it very specifically, your God will be my God. They converted. They were followers of God. So what's the reasoning here? God says, I will have no other gods before me. He didn't want them getting involved with someone who worshipped another god. Seems reasonable. Because to compromise in this area because of wanting to be like others or because you're in love is a direct disobedience to God and rebellion against Him. Now you might be thinking, okay, well that, that was good for the people of Israel. It really doesn't have any application to us today. Well, if you're thinking that, you're wrong. <laughs> Dead wrong. Because the New Testament speaks of this principle. It says to not be unequally yoked. <coughs> We're not talking about frying eggs. We're talking about couples being together. You want to spell it out a little bit more? Christian with Christian. Period. End of story. I don't care how wonderful the unbeliever might be. I don't care how amazing they are or how much you love him or her or he or she loves you. 
Folks, if they don't love Jesus, if they're not sold out to Jesus Christ, what are you doing even considering a relationship with that person? You're rebelling just like the nation of Israel had beforehand. And I can promise you, if you pursue it, it will cause grief and heart. I can also promise you that your ministry and your service for Christ will be compromised. Most people who have been ministering the years that I have been would have a very full book of marriages they performed. Mine is the full. <coughs> It's not even half full. It's not even a third full. Why do you suppose that is? Because of these principles. I would do a terrible disservice. No matter how much I might love you, I would be doing a terrible disservice to say, yeah, I understand. It's okay. You can get married even though he or she is not a Christian. I would also be rebelling against God and His Word, and I could expect my ministry to be shut down by Him. I'm a coward. I want to do it God's way. The second area is found in verse 31, and it deals with the Sabbath commitment. Now, as for the peoples of the land who bring wares or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or a holy day, and we will forgo the crops the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. This was a renewal of God's unique covenant relationship with Israel. So, is this particular issue of importance to us today as followers of Christ? And some of you are thinking, is it? I'm glad you asked that question. Now, we've talked about this before, but the ethical, moral principles taught in the law are still valid for us today, right? But the ceremonial and the political and the national laws are not applicable to us today. You and I are not under law. However, the Old Testament is still God's Word, isn't it? I can't walk out of this one, can I? If the Old Testament is still God's Word, then how does this apply? If nothing else, our commitment to God ought to influence how we act in our society in which we live. Do I treat every day as a work day? Or do I take a day and give it to God? Okay? Do I take a day and say, Lord, this is your day? We ought to where we don't do our usual stuff. We need that time of refreshment. Hebrews talks about needing a Sabbath rest. But it doesn't have to be on Saturday, which is the Sabbath. It doesn't have to be on Sunday. If it's on Sunday, I'm in big trouble. I mean, this is my work day. It's the only day I work all week. <laughs> And if you believe that, we've got some swampland someplace for you. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians. He didn't write that. We live not by the letter of the law, but rather by the spirit of the law. Okay? Folks, if you make a big issue about the Sabbath, then I expect to see you keep all the other hundreds of commandments to a T. It doesn't happen. Because a lot of them are purely ceremonial laws. But the principle of the Sabbath is a good principle. But don't do it to be legalistic. Do it because your body needs it. Let me just digress and give a quick illustration. A couple summers... We were doing harvesting from Burt Burnett, Texas, all the way to Great Falls, Montana, and during wheat harvest. And someone else owned the machinery. I was the foreman of the crew. And we had an agreement that we would not harvest grain on Sunday. That was our day to go to worship with whatever church family that this farmer was part of or whatever. If he wasn't, we'd find a church and we'd go worship there. And we would relax. We might do a little maintenance, but we try to keep it as low-key as possible. 
Well, things were getting a little bit tight. There was a couple of harvest crews that were undercutting price-wise and doing a bad job, but some of the farmers went ahead with it, so we were starting to lose some jobs. Well, the owner, he owned the machinery, and it's a lot of money out there you got to keep paying. Plus, he was paying us. That's a good thing. Decided this one Sunday he was going to work. Got a brand new farmer that didn't know his policy, and he decided to work on Sunday. And I, I went to him and I said, this is not good. This is not good. You made a commitment to us that we would not work on Sundays. And here you are doing it now. He wouldn't back down. We worked on Sunday. A couple days later in the week, something that does not happen normally. And it's the only time I've ever seen it happen. The left rear wheel on one of the combines fell off. That doesn't happen. It just, it just fell off in the middle of the field. The owner was not pleased. Normally we could harvest 100 acres per machine per day. That machine sat for over a day. Well, we had to go over 100 miles to get the part for it. You think God wants a Sabbath? The principle's there. We need a Sabbath. We need a time of rest, a time where we focus upon God. We have made every day like every other. We struggle to find time to read God's Word. We struggle to find time to worship with God's people. Maybe we need to ask ourselves, are we so busy pursuing the things of this world that we have forgotten the one who made this world? Just a thought. In verses 32 through 35, we see a commitment to God's sanctuary. It says, We also placed ourselves under obligation to contribute yearly one third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, for the continual grain offering, for the continual burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moon, for the appointed times, for the holy things, and for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of our God. It's a tax. It's a church tax, basically, if you want to look at it. Likewise, we cast supply, lots rather for the supply of wood among the priests, the Levites, and the people, so that they might bring it to the house of our God according to our Father's household at fixed times annually to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law, and that they might bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruit of every tree to the house of the Lord annually. Upkeep. Basically, in order for corporate worship to function as it ought to be, the way God designed it, the people needed to support it financially. So the people are saying, we're making a commitment that we're not going to get caught like we have in the past, where we've watched out for ourselves rather than God's sanctuary. We're going to make a commitment that we are going to pay a portion of all the upkeep and all the utilities and the property. Because neglecting God's household was seen as dishonoring to the Lord. And expecting only certain individuals to take care of this was never considered. It was an expectation of all God's people. Now, is there a principle for us today? What do you think I'm going to say? Yes. yes. Absolutely there is. You see, if we believe that God deserves our worship and our service, we need to provide the financial support that allows the church to do ministry in a way which honors God. Does that make sense? The bills don't get paid unless there's money in the bank. We can't be under a roof unless someone keeps the shingles. <laughs> Do you understand that? And folks, at the Parsonage, I praise God for those of you who help out and, and work with the wood. We have a nice toasty house to which you're welcome to come visit any time during the winter. Because we have firewood. We have, well today it's nice and toasty, but not because of the fuel oil, but because of the temperature. But we have a wonderful facility. We need to take care of it. Finally, verses 36 and 39, we see the commitment to God's servants. These verses describe the various tithes and offerings which God people provided. They were used to support all that was involved in the worship and work which God expected. 
And, and again, several times as you look back through the Old Testament, you see that oftentimes what the people brought was not sufficient to take care of the needs. Now the people are saying, uh-uh, I'm signing on the line here that we're going to do our best to make sure provision is going to be made through our gifts. So, how is this comparable to us today? Now many of us, when we purchase a house or a vehicle or, or some other object, we actually have a special dedication of that to the Lord. Uh, you've heard me make the comment, you know, Lord, this is your vehicle, it's up to you to maintain it. I do my best to maintain it physically. <laughs> Seriously, my wife and I, when we purchase a vehicle, we pray and we say, Lord, this is your vehicle. We'll do our best to take care of it, but we need your help. We want to use it for your honor and glory. When we bought our house, we made the same thing. Lord, this is your house. We give it to you. When we moved into the parsonage, we said, Lord, let this be a place of refuge, a safety place for others to come, a place where there's warm memories that are made, where there's joy and laughter. When we have children, we have a child dedication. We're saying, Lord, we know that we're responsible for taking care of this child. However, we give you this child. We dedicate this child to you. We need your help. And if you take this child before we think we're ready to give him up, he's yours to begin with. It's that recognition that all of it belongs to God. We want him to be glorified, whether it's in our lives, our family members, or our possessions. Now the Old Testament offerings were usually for the purpose of taking care of the priests and the Levites who were officially called to minister to God's people. Today, God calls specific individuals, such as myself and many others, who are committed to leading and working to minister to believers and to equip them to go out and do ministry. So the principle is that pastors, specifically, are supported by the church family to whom they minister. And again, my wife and I are grateful for your giving and your taking care of us. You can see, I'm well provided for you. Okay? God has blessed us. And I thank you for that. I do not take that for granted. Now, how should a Christian's commitment look today in view of what we've looked at here in Nehemiah chapter 10? Well, it seems obvious that there has to be a submission and a commitment to the absolute authority of God's Word. If God's Word is not your absolute authority, we have nothing more to talk about. And even though you and I may have some differences of opinion, maybe about the application of some of the principles in God's Word, we still hold on to the Bible as our absolute final authority. I also believe that we can gather from this passage the importance of not buying into or adopting the world's value system. It's so easy to get sucked into that, isn't it? It's so easy. But that flies in the face of our need to worship God alone. That is totally contradictory to doing things the way God wants it done. We were talking in Sunday school this morning that we should not be surprised when the world hates us. I'd rather the world hate me than God be disappointed in me. Finally, I'm encouraged by the fact that our worship community is the local church family which has been put into place by what Jesus Christ has done. Aren't you grateful for that? This is God's family. But it's only so because of Jesus. And each of us who is part of this church family needs to be faithful in several areas. One is in our worship, in corporate, corporate worship, attendance, equipping. That we come here not just because, well, it's Sunday morning, we haven't got anything better to do. We come here because we want to get together with God's people. We come here because we want to corporately worship the Lord alone. We come here because we say, I know God has something for me. I don't know what it is, but I know He's going to show me. That's why we come here. Then also each of us needs to be supportive of the church with our finances. And I don't know what that is for you. That's between you and God. 
But I dare say that many of us probably haven't taken time to talk with God about that. And we need to. We need to ask Him, am I living too high on the hog? Have you ever heard that phrase before? Am I living too much for myself? Too high on the hog means you're just enjoying the fat for yourself. Or can I be more sacrificial in my giving? Can I cut back in a few areas so I can give more to God's ministry? You see, when our commitment to God's Word, our commitment to God's ways, our commitment to the worship of God alone, when we're doing that, the world is better able to see Jesus. But when we're not doing that, they see us. And you know, who's going to bring about miraculous change? Not you and me. It's Jesus. So what's the world seeing in our lives? Are you willing to be committed? If you were back in that time, would you have been one of those people that said, hey, show me the papyrus. I want to sign on that scroll. I want my name to be down there so that my children and grandchildren know I made that commitment to live for Jesus no matter what. Let's stand as we close in prayer. <coughs> Father, I want to thank you so much for your word. As we look at this passage at first glance, we say, wow, there's just a lot of people there. What does that have to do with us? The Father, we know that you are unchanging. And you desire that your people live lives in such a way that they bring glory and honor to you. So Father, we pray that that will be what we look to do. Whatever area we need to, we want to live our lives for you. And Father, we don't look back and say, oh, I just messed up, there's no way I could change. We start today. And we move forward in the power of your Holy Spirit. Victorious because of what Jesus Christ has done. In his name, amen.